Would you say that God is all powerful? Yes. yes. Okay, so God would be God would be all powerful. Yes. He can be everywhere at one time. What's a big theological word that means that? Omnipresent. Omni meaning all and present meaning well. Present. It's just, it's easy, isn't it? Okay, yes. Love silly questions. Does God have magic? Does God have magic? Let me ask you a sillier question. Does God need magic? Can I that? Yes. Okay. As I understand it, and I am I am willing to be challenged in this, but magic, the concept of magic is basically the fact that you can manipulate the unseen forces of nature through spiritual means. Um, so magic is not so much that you yourself have power, but rather that you are able to manipulate unseen forces, um, etc. So anyway, so 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 God God has power to do things. What else? We said He's all present. He's all knowing. Did we say all knowing? Omniscient. Okay. Omni, omniscient to to know. Yes. God is eternal, that's very true. Now, I'm sure as I'm saying this, for some of you, if you don't have uh, a good knowledge of the Bible, then maybe this might just sound like we're just speaking off the top of our head. But for those of you who do, you're probably hearing many uh, echoes in your mind of Bible texts that you've heard saying these things about God, right? Uh, that, that, for example, in, in Isaiah, God is called the Everlasting Father, okay? Um, in Revelation, he's called the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. So God is eternal, he is all-knowing, he, um, he is omnipresent. This brings us to a second question that was asked, kind of a clarification. I made a statement, I think it was on Sunday night, may have been on, 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 on Sabbath, Sabbath evening, that Jesus did not know that he was God when he was born. What do I base that assumption on? Well, here the Bible says that he gave up his God-likeness. One of the things of being like God is omniscience, knowing all things, knowing the end from the beginning. But he became a human being, and he was born as a real baby to a real woman in a real stable. He lived a real life. And get a little closer. He had to re eat real food, and it processed itself, and our Lord Jesus Christ had to use the outhouse. Okay? <laughs> Now, I don't know why God would humble himself that much. And this is what Paul is trying to say. How could God humble himself so low to take the form of a servant? It, it's unbelievable. So then, if, there's, if that's what we understand, how many of you were born knowing everything about your life and what you would be from, from a child? How many people? You. Okay, good. Let's talk later. Um, maybe you can tell me in my future. So, so Jesus, if he was born as us, then he would have had to learn to talk, right? As a baby, before you can talk, you pretty much don't know anything. Um, there is, let, me, let me see if I can find this other verse in the Bible that maybe will, will help. Um, oh, yes, that, that's a wonderful verse. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I, just, I like the way the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Okay. I believe it is in Luke. I believe it is in chapter 2. Oh, I heard someone say 52. Okay. Run right the button there. It says what? And Jesus what? Increased in wisdom and what? And in stature, what does stature mean? Height. So he physically grew. What is wisdom? He mentally developed. And what else? And in favor with who? So he, he grew in his relationships with other human beings and, get this, in his relationship with God. So the relationship that Jesus had with God when he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit on the cross, was greater than the relationship he had with God as a three-year-old. See what I'm saying? So he had a real life experience just like you and me. This is why he could say crazy things like this. The things that I do, you will de do these things and greater. Why could he say those things? Because he did nothing in the flesh that a human being 
totally submitted to God could not do. Let me say that again. Jesus did nothing as a human being that you or I totally submitted to, to God could not do. I'll prove it to you. Did the disciples heal? Did the disciples raise the dead? Yes. Peter? Dorcas? Remember that story? Jesus, Jesus was so filled with the Holy Spirit that people, you know, if they just, the woman just touched the hem of his garment. Remember that story? And she was healed. Did it ever happen that one of his disciples was able to use their clothing to heal somebody? Did that happen? Peter, right? They were taking, they would just lay handkerchiefs on him and they would, they would take it. That's why if you watch the God channel on some of those random channels, they'll be trying to sell you their handkerchief, you know? I think they're trying to, they're trying to channel that kind of concept. I'm so holy, I'm so, if you buy my handkerchief, you'll get healed. I, you know, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put, spend the money that way in this recession. But anyway, um, yes. At what point did he know he was God? We know that at least by the age of 12, he had an understanding. Do you remember that? Do you remember the story in the temple? Jesus goes to the temple uh, at the age of about 12 with his mother, Mary and Joseph, and they go home and they lose him. Do you remember? And then they have to go back to Jerusalem and they're looking for him and finally they find him. And I love this scene in the Bible because now here's Mary uh, speaking as a mother with a mother's heart. Now she gave birth to God. So, I mean, that's going to that's gonna mess with your whole parenting scheme right there. I mean, give birth to your creator. How do you, how do you discipline? I mean, what are the boundaries? Um, it's, it's tough. But, but, she, but it, she, you know, the reality that she almost lost her son gets to her. She's like, so we've been looking for you. I have suffered many things these days because of you. And what did Jesus say? Didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? Now, clearly, he wasn't there doing carpentry. So he wasn't talking about Joseph. So he was letting them know, I now realize that my father is God himself. So at least by the age of 12. Now, he didn't know him by the age of 5. But biblically, we can say at least by the age of 12, he understood who he was. Now, question. If he's not omniscient, how did he get this knowledge? Bible study. How do you know that Jesus is God? Right? Prophecies of Daniel, the prophecies of the Old Testament. I mean, any person can randomly say, I'm Jesus. How do we know they're not Jesus? Right? The scripture gives us these guidelines, and perhaps at another time we can go through um, some of these, um, these, these prophetic things that point to Jesus. So Jesus saw his own life fulfilling prophecy, and of course he had the testimony of his mother, of his amazing birth. And these things added up to the point where he accepted, based on the Bible, but ultimately by faith, that he was God. Because God only told him that he was his son after he was baptized. That's the whole other sermon, but I won't, I won't go there. I have to ring myself in. I see a hand way at the back. Could he have sinned? Yes. Did was he tempted? Yes. Does do you remember a verse in Hebrews where it says that he was tempted in how many points? All points as who is? As we are yet without sin. What does the word yet mean? If I say Oh, you know, I was about to run out of money, yet I had five pounds. What does that mean? It's connected. It's, it's connected, but it's showing a contrast. Like, like it almost didn't happen, but then, wow. So Paul here in Hebrews is trying to express, really and truly, it's amazing that he was able to be tempted in all these points, yet without sin. Wow. Isn't this a God we can follow? So yes, he could have sinned, but he didn't sin. He didn't sin. And that, that's, that's very crucial that we have to understand this. If Jesus had sinned, here's a, here's a question. If Jesus had sinned, could he be your sin bearer? What would have happened to him? 
That is a question you're going to have to ask Jesus when you meet him. He has not revealed that to me. I don't think the Bible speaks of that. But I think maybe the whole universe would have just exploded and just gone to nothing. Because the Bible says that in Christ, all things hold together. All things consist. In him we live, we move, we have our being. In other words, literally, the, the, the concept is that Jesus is literally holding the whole universe together. The laws of physics and chemistry and biology only exist because of him. So if something happens to him, the whole thing starts to fall apart. So I don't know. I mean, he's God. The Bible says God cannot sin. So if he sinned, would sin that have not been sin? I don't know. We, I mean, it just, your mind starts to get bendy. So we won't, we won't talk about that. But the excellent question. Yes, sister. Which point was that? That point when the people, when the Holy Spirit tried to be crucified, and they were trying to capture him when he was disappeared. Was it angels that took him out? There are several stories about when Jesus was about to be captured. There's one when he came um, to his hometown to Nazareth after he had been anointed by the Holy Ghost, who was in the wilderness for 40 days. He then comes to Nazareth, I think it's Luke 4 that describes it. He preaches this sermon, he preaches from Isaiah 61, and he tells them, you know, basically, I fulfill this prophecy, and they get really upset with him, because in general, they don't like people in church claiming to be God. You know, they have a general rule against that. Um, so they decide, well, we'll kill him. Because, I mean, that's what you should do if you disagree with people, you know, <laughs> spiritually. Just, just kill them. Anyway, so they decide to kill him, and they take him to the precipice, but he disappears. And that happens, that happens several times. Yes, you know, he has these, these things. Let me, let me take a slight, let me just step over here slightly um, to speak from the perspective of, um, of Ellen White. For those of you who are not familiar with her writings, um, she's a woman who lived in the 18th century, and she wrote very insightfully into the life of Jesus Christ. She says that there were times, there were moments, when, as she puts it, divinity flashed through humanity. So the concept is that Christ was 100% divine and 100% human. The Bible calls this a mystery. It's, it's really a mystery how this can actually work out. But he did not use his divine powers. But there were occasions when it was like, you know, that humanity was trying so hard to hold back omnipotent God. I mean, think about this. God is, God is, God is omnipotent. He's, all, he's everywhere. And yet somehow... He was able to squeeze that everything down into a single cell at the moment of his conception. He was one cell big, God of the whole universe. I mean, it blows my mind. But so every so often, it's just like the, the humanity couldn't quite veil him, and it would just flash through. And, uh, and, 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 and people, would, people would be like, okay, that was weird. Well, that's, this is not a normal guy, you know? But, but yes. Okay, yes. Um, I was going to ask, you know that um, when you say that God left his divinity and he was like, he became human, and even the disciples were also at the level of spirituality where like, they could do like things that Jesus could. If we don't reach, like, if we're not at the stage where we say we can heal people or something, does that mean that we can't get to heaven? Okay, the question is, do you need to heal people to get to heaven? No. Do you need to reach that level of spirituality to get to heaven? No. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember the thief on the cross? Remember that story? For those of you who are not familiar, when Jesus was crucified, when he was finally killed, they finally caught up with him. Um, they hung him on a cross between two thieves. And for most of his crucifixion, the thieves were insulting him, both of them. And then at some point, one of the thieves, their conscious, conscience got the best of them. They started saying, wait, no this, no, this guy is different, you know? And so he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Okay, you remember that story? So the thief is on the cross dying. And Jesus says, verily I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. In other words, you'll make it to heaven. Question, what did that thief do from that point after he was saved? 
till the end of his life to prove that he was really ready for heaven. He basically just died, is what, is what happened to him. He didn't have an opportunity to even be baptized. Um, I'm just going to pass over that. Pass over. He, he didn't have an opportunity to de demonstrate that he was, uh, had any of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, he didn't have an opportunity to do a lot of things. But unless Jesus was not telling the truth, I expect him to be at the front of the queue in paradise. So, clearly, there is a connection, but at the same time, there is a difference between salvation and growth in grace. Both are necessary. It's not either or. But growth in grace is not salvation. And salvation is not growth in grace. The agent of them is both the same. It's the power of God through the Holy Spirit. But we must in our minds realize that once we accept Jesus Christ, he saves us from that point. And then because he saves us, he's like, but you, I mean, look at you. You're a mess. Let me help you. We clean your life up because you don't even like your life. I mean, you hate yourself. I mean, that's why you, you came to me, because you finally realized you don't really like your life. So I want to help you, you know. But me helping you is not salvation. Salvation is what I give you when you accept me. It's, 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 it's a concept that we have to continually learn again and again. Going back again to Ellen White, she says that the science of salvation will be our study throughout the ages of eternity. In other words, after we've been in heaven for a million years, we'll be like, oh, right, now I get it. Of course, because it's faith. Right, yeah. I see, I get that now. And then a million years after that, oh, no, I get it. Even the angels, the Bible says that even the angels desire to look into these things. They don't even quite understand it. They're still trying to wrap their minds around it. So it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And in heaven, Jesus will answer the questions, and I'll just be sitting down, so... You don't have to worry about that. Yes, sister. How would you explain that question that Jesus is trying to give all points? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you explain somebody in that text? And they ask you, how could that be? He wasn't married. He didn't have any children. He didn't experience, he didn't get a chance to smoke. How would you explain? Okay, good question. What does it mean to be tempted in all points? Well, let's, let's, let's find this text. There's a wonderful text in James. Now I'm just going to show you just, just to demonstrate the function of this software. So there is a text in James that says, um, that describes temptation. It says everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, etc, etc. So let's say that we don't remember exactly where that is. Okay? We can go to the little search box, I just right click, put on the search, and then we're going to search, we know it's in the New Testament, we click here, we're going to search for some of those words, okay? So I know, for example, the word lust is in there, and eyes, okay? So I'm going to search lust, eyes, enter. It's not James, it's, it's, it's first John. See, so it's even in the wrong book. And so now it tells you, it, it brings you right to that verse. So if, 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 you're, if you're trying to study something and you're trying to remember where something is, this software is really helpful and it can help you to get there. This is the, the, long, the short way of what a concordance could do, because you can do the same kind of thing in a concordance, just take a little bit longer. Anyway, let's, get, let's go right there. We'll cancel that. Okay. Let's read from verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. Okay, it says what? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not him. In, in, in him. 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. Here John summarizes everything that is in the world that is not of God into three categories. What does he say? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Let's, let's break this down a little bit. What does lust mean? What, is, what does the word lust mean? Now let, let me show you something else that's really cool here. Okay, if I click here on this KJV plus, now it's, it's changed everything, and you can see these little green numbers. These are concordance numbers, and these numbers can tell you the meaning of the original word 
the word in the original language, okay? So for example, I want to find out what is the word, what is the word lust here? Okay, so I click on here, it gives me a little meaning, okay? It tells you the original Greek word, epithumai, and then it says, it means a longing, especially when it's um, forbidden, con concupiscence, which I can never say that word. I just love KJV words, they're great. Okay. <laughs> Desire. Okay, so it gives me a little bit more information about what the word meant in the original language. So my study can start to scratch a little bit more deeper. Anyway. So lust means a desire in after. So in other words, there are three kinds of things. There is a desire that is in our flesh or in our body, in our physical being. Then there is a, a desiring that we have with our eyes. What do you think that means? Ones that you want, but this is more, more mental, you know? So for example, a physical lust could be, I'm, I just want to eat more food. I mean, that's just in my body. But a lust of the eyes could be more about, you know, um, wanting to be the best, you know, just craving being number one, you know, it's not so much a physical desire, if I don't get it, I will die, but it's more of a, something that, that, that I, I experience through my eyes, through my senses. And then finally, there's the pride of life, okay, and that refers to being proud in your life, having a life that you just live for yourself and with pride and money and fame and all that good stuff. Did the devil offer Jesus these things yeah. in his temptation? The temptation that was recorded. Now, the devil kept tempting Jesus all the time. But the three temptations that were recorded, what did he say? First one. If you are the Son of God, can turn the stones into bread. Okay? What kind of lust is that? Flesh. He's hungry. You physically want to eat. Okay? What about the second one? Um, uh, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself off the temple. The angels will bear you up. Okay, that, that one was a lot of the eyes. Let me give you a little bit of background detail. There was a myth or a rumor among the Jewish people of that time that when Messiah came, he would float down from the sky in the temple and just sort of land and just flutter down. And when that happened, this was their, their myth. It's not biblical, but they started to believe this. They would know that this is the Messiah. Okay? So the devil was saying, listen, if you do this, I mean, you've come to because you're the son of God, right? If you do this and the angels bang up and you don't die, everyone will accept you. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be accepted in a way. You'll be able to do what you want to do. You'll achieve your goal, okay? So again, he was appealing to the last of, of, of the eye, you know? Uh, like I said, you know, having the thing that you desire, that you're seeking for. Third temptation. He, he said, if you worship me, what? I will give you everything, okay? Part of life. I will make you the ruler of this whole thing. You will be the number one guy, okay? Obviously, there is, there is some overlap between the categories. But even in that, those three temptations, Jesus experienced the three categories that all temptation is thrown into. And so that is what I would answer when it comes to how can Jesus experience temptation with cigarettes? They weren't cigarettes. Well, no, but the temptation for cigarettes is similar to many other temptations. And so... To conquer the ones he faced is the same as, as, as what we experienced. But then there's one other thing I would say. Jesus experienced temptation on a level far greater than we will ever have to experience. Now remember, he laid down his divinity. It wasn't taken from him. He laid it down. What would you do if you had divine power? <laughs> and someone comes up to you, spits in your face, and then slaps you because you say you are in fact God. Now, now you are God, and they're spitting in your face because you said the truth, and you also have divine power. Would that be a temptation? <laughs> We need to, so to pray for a while. Maybe that's why he didn't say anything, because he was just like, <laughs> Answer us! Because <laughs> if I say anything right now, you would just be incinerated, you know? I'm just gonna. I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe that's not why. But, but, but the point is that he had the temptation to use his divinity to ease the situations that he was going through. 
And if you think about many of the temptations that we ourselves face, don't we often get tempted to do things that will ease the situation we're going through? We're experiencing stress in the job, and so it's just so tempting to just, you know, a little tip on, just eases the stress. Or just, you know, being involved in, in, in just watching hours and hours of TV just eases us, don't we have to think about it. So he had that temptation, but on the unbelievable scale. So we don't have to be afraid that what we suffer today, because we have the internet, is harder than what Jesus went through. Okay? Don't even worry about that. He has been where you could never even go. Um, we, we really are at the end. Um, is there one more question? And we will end on this one. Yes? Can the devil hear your thoughts? Yes. 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 Yes.
keep tracks on you. Some of you husbands and wives, you almost know what each other are thinking at this point. I heard, a, I heard someone say one time that sometimes you get to a stage in marriage where you've been married so long, you really know what the other person is going to do. And you, I mean, you really know. And so there is no point to argue except for entertainment. <laughs> because, I mean, you already know what they're going to say, you know how they'll react, you know how you'll react, you can predict the whole thing. So at this point, it's just entertainment. I don't know if that's true, I've only been married for two years, but um, the devil, having studied you since you were born, knows 99% of the time what you will do if a situation turns up. So in that sense, sometimes it seems like he reads our thoughts because it's like, wow, how did that happen again? I mean, I just... But that's not because he's, he's a brain uh, mind reader, but rather because he has been a student of you. So you don't have to be afraid to pray out loud. If, he, if you pray out loud, the devil won't hear your prayers and then somehow make sure it doesn't happen. He is not that powerful. Um, so can he be saved? Can he be saved? Revelation says that he will be thrown into the lake of fire. <laughs> so... That's okay. No, no, it's a good question. So I'm guessing probably not. Uh, the lake of fire is really not a good, a good scene. Um, Wow. Don't, don't vacation though. Wait, so not because he chooses not to. Like, if. Mm -hmm. I mean, could, can he repent? Yeah, like if one day he decided, you know what? I had his already had his chance. He was right. He would have war against God. Okay. You know that God's. This, this is a good question. Maybe we should add here. Let me, let me just. This is a good question. Is it that the devil. Is it, is it that God cannot save the devil? Or is it that the devil has chosen? Not to be saved. Again, I must step out here and speak from the perspective of, of Ellen White. She shares some very wonderful insights into, into the, the interaction that God had with Satan before this whole conflict happened in this world. I recommend for you to read the first couple of chapters of Patriarchs and Prophets. But the basic concept is that God labored long with the devil. And the devil chose. Now, what you have to understand is that the devil... And, and it says so in Isaiah and Ezekiel, he was the covering cherub. He was the closest a created being has ever been to God. So he sinned in the direct light of the knowledge of God's love. He was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. And when a person chooses to go against God, and they, they, they push away all his advances. Because God is a gentleman, he will not force somebody to love him who does not love him. There is a word that we have in English for a person who forces love. God is not that kind of a person. And so he let the devil go. And it breaks, it breaks his heart. And so the devil will not be saved. And there are unfortunately, human beings who will make the same decision. I don't get it because I'm not a good person. I'm not standing here today because I'm, I'm a very bad person, okay? I'm just going to be honest. I'm not a very good person. Many of you here are much better than me at being consistent Christians. But one thing I have discovered is that if God is willing to work with me, why would I say no to that? I mean, the other option is just, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's, it's not really an option for me. So if I am lost, it will not be because I have rejected God. It will be because perhaps somehow in God's wisdom, he realized that there was nothing he could do to make me fit for heaven. But having read the Bible, I realized that there, that is impossible because God says that not only does he give us the will to do his good pleasure, but also the power to actually carry it through. And so he's taken responsibility on himself to make our characters and our lives fit for his glory. So as long as we are willing to work with him, he's going to keep working with us. So I, I, I'm going to throw away salvation. The devil did. Now, I, like I said... I, there are some decisions the devil made that I, I really scratch my head on. I don't throw away eternity. 
Not a smart move in my opinion, but you know, he's, he's free to do what he wants. Anyway, let's, 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 close it to, let's bring it to a close there. Let's uh, say a prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for these questions. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for these mysteries that you came in humanity, yet you were still fully God. We thank you for your grace that can save a thief from the cross. And we thank you for your love that doesn't force any of us to have a relationship with you. But Lord, when we see how much you have done for us, why would we not want to? Why would we in our hearts turn away from that love? I pray, Lord, that you will always keep us coming towards you. Keep us studying your word. Thank you for these questions. I know that I didn't answer them the way that you would have answered them if you were here. But I just pray that through this time we would see that um, the Bible is rich and full of answers and meanings and that all of us would dig deeper into the word ourselves in our own private time so that we can discover you for ourselves. Bless those who have come out tonight and bring us tomorrow as we continue with our revival in full. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.